I cannot believe I am honored enough to, privileged enough to introduce this man. I heard him speak as a keynote speaker at GameSoundCon years ago, and I thought, wow, this was good. And then he was nice enough to Skype in with my video game music class. I let them choose sometimes who they want to have as the Skype speaker. Embarrassingly, I have never played Halo or Destiny or I think any game that Marty has made the music to act. But I know his music from uh, We Are Flintstone Kids, 10 Million Strong, and Growing. You know, his career as a jingle writer, <laughs> Mr. Clean, that, that stuff. So <laughs> I still, and, and I listened to music of the spheres when that just leaked. Or <laughs> okay, one person is excited about it, so you sold one. Um, anyway, I can't wait to hear what he has to say. Please give a huge welcome to Marty O'Donnell. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, Matt just did a bunch of spoilers, so I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do now. Um, first of all, yes, I want to say thank you very much to Matthew Thompson. Uh, this is an honor for me to be here at the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance and the fifth annual conference on video game music. Uh, I don't usually do uh, academic conferences, and I gotta say, since last time I was, I'm not gonna say how many years ago it was, well, maybe you'll figure it out in my talk. Um, when I was getting my master's degree in music composition from USC, Nintendo hadn't even shipped a console yet, okay? So this is how far back that goes. Uh, I liked, I enjoyed video games, but uh, I was not thinking I was ever gonna be part of that. Um, and that was the last time I was really in an academic environment. So this has really been interesting today to find out that after all these years that I've been working on video games, there's a whole slew of people who are actually studying them. That's just, it's actually mind-blowing to me. I really didn't know that there were people doing papers on video games and music and video games. I just, I just haven't paid attention. So from now on, I will pay attention. I think it's really cool. But this means that I'm going to do an academic talk. I'm not gonna push product. I'm not gonna talk about the latest, greatest stuff. I'm not gonna try to sell anything. This is, I'm gonna try to be as academic as possible. Because making games is a serious business, and this is going to be a serious keynote speech. Okay. <laughs> and that's good. Um, throughout the course of this talk, where I have just incredible PowerPoint skills, as you will see, pretty much involves ser searching the internet and just throwing things at the screen. Um, if you think I'm expecting a laugh, just laugh. Because then just, just help it, just help it move along. All right. So the topic of this speech, um, and by the way, this is my sort of ginger um, slide. It's the palate cleansing slide. Every time, every time you see that, it means new thought. Because I ping pong around, as you can already tell. Okay. So the uh, title of my speech is "Creativity and Technology" by me, Marty O'Donnell, and. Um, chocolate and peanut butter? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or oil and water? Oil and water don't mix. Because it's science. Okay, so the answer to this question, uh, chocolate and peanut butter or oil and water, creativity and technology, is... Uh, which is it? It is coming up any minute now. Yes. That's the answer to this question. Were you gonna, are you going to change for me or are you not? There it is. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Now you've learned something. So, that was the end of that. That was the academic portion of that. <laughs> so let's go and let, let's talk a little bit about myself because that's more interesting than the topic of this whole thing. Um, so what I want you to know is that my uh, parents were very creative people. I had a father who was a film director. My mother was a piano teacher. Um, we had creative, I, I just grew up in a very creative household. And, and one of the things I think is important and that was part of my upbringing was that no matter what I wanted to do, I never heard from one of my parents, you can't make a living doing that. 
So I could choose to do anything. And they basically, what could they say? A film director and piano teacher, they had nothing to say. So at one point when I was four years old, uh, my father brought home a soundtrack to a movie that was current at the time. And he let me play it on, it was a vinyl album, and I played it, and it went like this. studied this album as a four-year-old and I realized that I wanted to be this guy when I grew up. Nicholas Rosa, we were talking about him earlier today. So it's kind of creepy that a four-year-old kid would want to turn into that guy. But anyway, what I, 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 I really, really did. I thought someone who can just do music and make you feel so strongly. That's just so powerful, I wanted to do that. So then a few years later, I heard this. Yesterday, all my troubles seemed so far away. And all the girls were going nuts. So I realized, actually what I want to be is a rock star. So, um, Suddenly. Yeah, that's, that's me. Okay. Uh, so the funny thing is, of course, maybe it's not that funny, but I, I uh, didn't turn out to either be Nicholas Rosa or uh, a, a rock star. Um, but what I did realize is that I wanted to be a creative person. I wanted to live a creative life. I wanted to make that choice. And I found uh, a poet named Basho who was 16th century, I believe, 17th century Japanese poet, and his quote is, um, don't follow in the footsteps of the masters. Seek what they sought. And I just love that thing, because if you follow in someone's footsteps, you will just end up copying what they do. So rather than trying to follow in any particular person's footsteps, what I wanted to try to figure out is, like, what are these, what are these people, what were they seeking? And can I go after that too? And basically, you sort of make your own path, which is what I did. So I played piano my whole life. It seemed like a logical thing uh, for me to become a piano major. I went to the conservatory and was a piano major, piano performance major. Um, as an aside, I was talking at lunch today about this. So Cristofori invented the piano, and he called it harpsichord that can play soft and loud. He wasn't big on branding, obviously, <laughs> but it sounds great in Italian, but what actually it is is piano forte, piano a forte, and of course everybody shortened it to piano forte, and now we just call it piano. So I started out as a performance major in um, soft. So, <laughs> all of you soft majors, any other soft majors out there? Yeah, okay. Uh, which is weird, but that's what it is. So I played some Brahms. Some Debussy. But I still was still interested in perhaps becoming a rock star, so because that seemed better. Uh, so I had a prog rock band when I was in co college. Um, so it's dating myself a little bit, but I hear Prague is sort of making a comeback. Anybody Prague heads out there? Oh, oh good, 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 good. Uh, for those of you who don't know exactly know what Prague rock and fusion is, uh, fusion is sort of a jazz thing. Prague is instrumentals for 10 minutes and then you start singing. It's rock and roll with that. Okay, so I really love, yes. I figured out all these tunes and taught them to my, the guys in my band. I even played flute. I played Jeff Tull flute and keyboard. All in, all, each, 
man, man, oh, man, you guys know this one? Man in each you don't know this? Can, Alright, let's listen to this for a second. She can, 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 she well, maybe I just have to abandon this. Blink. Chick Corea, Return to Forever. Spectacular. And how about some... This is not necessarily prog, but it's just so good. How could you not love it? Okay. That is so cool. All right. So what happened was I was in a band and we played that stuff. I was the one that had the best ear, so I figured out all the parts, taught it to the, to, to the folks in the band. Um, and one day the drummer said to me, I was a piano major and I had this band on the side, and the, and the drummer, who was a good friend, said to me, hey, Marty, you keep figuring out all these tunes. It's really hard, but it's all other people's music. Why don't you write something? And I was, at this point, I was already a junior, uh, beginning of my junior year in, in college. And, um, or actually, it might have been a few months earlier, but that's when I made the switch. But he said, why don't you write something? And I thought, can I do that? Is that allowed? It just never really occurred to me. It was just like, it was all about other people's music and performing it and figuring it out. Like, I'm not worthy, right, to write my own music. And uh, somebody, Besides the drummer, he says, you know, what else can you do? Like, you either perform somebody's music or you write music. Why don't you try it? So I went to my piano. I thought, well, you know, Walt plays the guitar. My other guitar player, Larry, could play this. They could play this thing together. And Tim could play this on the organ. I'll play it. You know, I threw this thing together, went down there, and they loved it. I loved it. And I'm like, that's it. That's what I would rather do. I'd rather... Especially after I gave a concert, I was in a recital, and I did really, really well, but I, I absolutely hated it. Um, and I was thinking, why am I a performance major if I don't enjoy performing? So that was like, so be true to yourself, right? Figure out what you actually enjoy doing. So I switched to composition, much to the dean of the conservatory's dismay, and started studying more seriously. People like Stravinsky, who's basically orchestral rock and roll, right? Okay. <laughs> yes. I had played Barber excursions on the piano, but when I heard this, um, I was like, yes, that's amazing. Of course, Polst. So I'm just giving you the stuff that actually touched me emotionally. If I ever write something this beautiful, then I'll just hang it up. Went to grad school at USC, started studying Bartok string quartets. Spectacular. If you haven't studied them, you should. And then, of course, movie composition. I love Jerry Goldsmith. He's my favorite of all the composers. So, I got my master's degree, got married, had a baby, um, and had no job. <laughs> so I moved back to Chicago and started working. Uh, I thought I was going to get a teaching job, but I didn't. But uh, as I was working, I was, I was a grip on a, on a film set. I told you my dad directed movies, so I had some connections in the film industry in Chicago. Um, one day, I was on the set, and the producer came up to me, and she said, hey, Marty, you've got this degree in music, and you compose music. Why don't you write music for commercials and film. And I said, I don't want to prostitute my art. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Yes, came, those words came out of my mouth. Uh, the next, and this is absolutely true, the very next day on the same set, the director came up to me and he said, hey, Marty, uh, I got $500 if you score the film we're working on. I'm like, yes, I'll do it. <laughs> so what I realized, it had nothing to do with, well, let's see. I don't want to be vulgar here, but I guess I just didn't know what my price was, apparently. <laughs> it was $500, which of course didn't work out because I didn't have any equipment, so I went to my friend Mike Salvatore's house. He had a little recording studio, and we started working together, and I had to split it with him, and then of course we had to split that with the government. So my price is about $167, in case <laughs> that's what it turns out to be. Uh, so here, you know, what's funny is, um, the very first thing we did was this. Not exactly Holst. Okay. But that got us to the point where we could buy some equipment, bought a Profit 5 synthesizer, bought the Poly Sequencer, and then we got some more gigs. We got a gig for McDonald's, which was uh, a symphonic version of their jingle. That's what the assignment was. So I cheated and I decided I would do the Eroica Third Symphony, Beethoven's Third Symphony, plus the jingle at the time, which was, you deserve a break today, da 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 Do you know that one? Okay, somebody does, that's good. So this is using the Prophet 5 synthesizer and the poly sequencer. This is before MIDI. <laughs> See, you guys are like, is there, was there something before MIDI? Yes. And Mike's wife is playing the uh, violin that we overdubbed a few times. See, this is only funny in a crowd like this, so way to go. So th this allowed us to move downtown Chicago and build a studio downtown. Did you see some of that equipment? I mean, that, look at the wood grain, it's just amazing. All, obviously all tape stuff, uh, a drumulator, this will come in handy, there's the Prophet 5, Fender Rhodes. So we were ready to go. This led to more stuff. We finally got some national commercials, including this one. That's my five-year-old daughter saying and growing. Yeah, she's now 67 years old. <laughs> um, you know, in a couple more years, that's not gonna get a laugh, because people are going, yeah, she might be 67. <laughs> so, uh, so one night, Mike and I were working on some more commercials, and this was another national commercial. We were working late into the night and we started arguing about something. And this is the commercial that we were arguing about scoring. It's a commercial for Tidy Cat 3. Cat 3, with the power to absorb odors and deodorize for a fresh, clean scent. Making Tidy Cat 3 the number one cat box filler in America. So whether you have one of these or lots of them, all you need is one of these. The Tidy Cat Team clobbers cat box odor. And I realized I had prostituted my art. <laughs> it was really fun to do commercials for a while and do national commercials and, and, and make a living and build stuff. But I was like, wow, is this what I'm arguing about? Claymation cats for kitty litter. I mean, anyway, so I had a new kind of creative urge. I had to get out of that and I started looking at other places. I happened to meet, um, uh, a friend of mine had a son who was at the time 18 years old and he was working uh, at a small little place in Spokane. He came to visit me because he wanted to do music or maybe art. He wasn't exactly sure which thing he wanted to do. But he came and he saw that I liked, uh, I had some video games up on my shelf. And he says, yeah, I have friends who make video games. And I thought, well, that's cute, you know, he's 18. What can I <laughs> he says, so I'll come over to your house, to, let me come over to your house and I'll show you I have a beta version of it. And it turned out to be this game. Uh, which no one had seen before. So he put it in, it started up, I was absolutely like, okay, I need to start doing this. This is way cooler than what I'm doing. I found the next thing I wanna do. 
uh, he, I said, you got to introduce me to your friends. And he goes, oh, okay, we'll see what happens. And so um, I became really annoying, and I figured out a way to get their attention. And one of the things I did was I took... I mean, the, the game finally came out, and I was sitting there like, how do I get these guys' attention? Uh, I knew that they needed me, because I was doing professional stuff, and they were doing stuff by the seat of their pants. I mean, they really were, and they were amazing, but they didn't have any experience with, with actual music production or uh, sound production. But they were, had such great creative instincts, it was just amazing. Uh, so I've covered some of Robin's music and sent it to him. Robin. This is me and Mike in our new studio. So I got their attention. I said, you need to work with us. Uh, got a meeting with them. And this was our new studio. This was the last big studio we built uh, in Chicago. It was great. And this led to games. We ended up doing Riven, the sequel to Mist. Ended up working with Bungie on Myth 1 and 2, a game called Subterracore. Nobody, okay. <laughs> that was a problem with that game. Nobody played it. Okay. Uh, but so I'm going to do a quick thing here. I'm going to play you a little bit from Myth 2 Soul Blighter. This is the epilogue. And listen carefully, see if you recognize anything. I can copy myself, okay? <laughs> Unfortunately, during this production period, that studio burned to the ground. I mean, total destruction. We were back in Mike's basement like we were in the early days. Um, but I was still working. Bungie came up to me and said, we got this opportunity to go uh, have Steve Jobs introduce this new game we were working on called Halo. And I said, okay, Mike, let's do this thing. It's got to be ancient, mysterious, and epic. Ancient, ancient. I thought about it in the car. That means monks. We talked about this trope, whatever, whatever you guys were calling it. Folk, something, something, something. Very intelligent. I was just thinking, <laughs> it sounds old. Monks it is. So here we go. So this, our little company, Bungie, after we made a deal with Steve Jobs, Macworld got bought by Bill Gates, and Microsoft moved the whole team out there. We ended up doing Halo, Halo 2, Halo 3, Halo 3 ODST, one of my favorites, and Halo Reach. And once we did, that was over a 10 year period. So that went from like, uh, I think we did the Macworld thing in 99. We shipped Reach in 2010. I, was shocked that we were doing all this work. It was, it was amazing, but uh, that's what we did. We've actually got ourselves back independent of Microsoft in 2007 while we were finishing up some Halo stuff uh, because what we wanted to do was own our IP, do something brand new, and so we did, um, this led to Destiny. I got to write music with one of my childhood heroes. Which was shocking. And there's a whole story behind that, which I won't go into, but it was uh, one of the highlights of my life, obviously, to, to actually be able to work with Paul McCartney, uh, who was in Wings, and then before that, he was in another band called The Beatles. Okay. Uh, this picture sort of cracks me up. If it looks like I'm judging, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> Maybe I was, just, no, I wasn't, I swear I wasn't. Um, so, let's get back to the subject of the keynote. Now that you, now we're pretty much caught up with me, almost. Let's just pretend we're caught up. So, creativity, technology, chocolate, peanut butter, oil, and water. I think the important thing to do, and I learned this just from sitting here today, is uh, let's define some terms. 
Why did you laugh at that and not laugh at everybody else's <laughs> definition thing? Okay. So creativity, the use of the imagination or original ideas, especially in the production of an artistic work. This I feel like I understand pretty well. I think one of the things I'd like to just remind everybody in the room, and well, not remind, I'm probably gonna preach here a little bit. I think creativity is something you're born with. I think pretty much everybody's born with creativity. Uh, some are more creative than others. Uh, a lot of times I think our public education system or individuals in our family can smash the hell out of your creative urges when you're little. Uh, I heard a statistic one time where something like 95% of all children that are in kindergarten, when they're asked, are you an artist, they all say yes. And by the time they graduate high school, it's like 2% say that they're artists. So I think something happens in the intervening uh, 14 years that sort of smashes creativity out of people's Probably someone saying, you can't make a living doing that, which is death. Don't ever say that to anybody. You might not make a living doing it. <laughs> That's the truth, but <clears throat> don't say that. All right. Uh, and what I would also say about uh, creativity is, I think it's really hard to teach it. I think the, about the best you can do is encourage it. Uh, mentor people when they're being creative. Uh, show by example what creativity is, just create a really wonderful, safe environment for people who are, are exercising creativity. Teaching it is really, really hard, which brings us to technology. You see where this is going, don't you? The application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, especially in industry. And frankly, uh, I actually think it's easier to teach technology than it is creativity, which is why I think the majority of classes are based on some sort of technology. And technology is not just um, uh, mechanical or engineering. It can also be theory. Music theory is a kind of technology. It's not necessarily creative, but it is very helpful technology. So, um, does, does the technology help make us better creators? Perhaps. As a matter of fact, for sure it does. But not always. So one more term is Luddite. Uh, so that's a person opposed to increased industrialization or a new technology. That's actually not technically the real, but who cares? That's what we all say Luddites are. I'm not a Luddite. Um, but, you, I, have you noticed my PowerPoint skills getting better and better? <laughs> um, let's just uh, let's, let's go ping pong back to something else. Let's, let's look at the history of technology just in my lifetime. I was born in 1955, um, which was a very good year. Uh, I'm going to show you some other people who were born in 1955 who graduated from high school the same year I did. Um, Bill, Steve, and of course me. <laughs> Isn't that great? So you know, there, there you go. You have there, that's a that's a nice mix of creativity and technology right there. <laughs> and I've met both these guys. Uh, Steve, of course, being just sort of incredible combination of creative and, and technology. Uh, Bill being pretty much one thing. <laughs> but very smart and a good poker player, by the way, too. But I, 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 to be honest with you, I, I can say this now. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being streamed, right? <laughs> I'm not sure how creative Bill would, would it actually is, but he's genius. Uh, so here we go. So from this point, there's, this is Moore's Law. Uh, this is something that was invented in my lifetime, or discovered in my lifetime. It has to do with um, something that you should look up, because I'm not going to explain it. But let's just say this. Moore's Law means that technology goes absolutely nuts, which it did in my lifetime. So here's, another, here's a little example. And I heard this in a TED Talk recently. We went to the moon on less computer power, computing power, than you probably have in your pocket right now. And I'm not talking about your smartphone. I'm talking about 
your key fob. That's true, it was on a TED talk. <laughs> Think about that. That's insane. So, what does this mean? All right, so I'm gonna ping pong some more. Let's go into some technology. I'm gonna talk about technology that started uh, really impacting me as a creative person, as a composer. So, back when I was at USC, so you thought, I, I thought, I, you thought we were done with all that. <laughs> uh, the head of the theory composition department, uh, Professor Robert Lynn, uh, I was at his house, I was a TA, and I got to go to his house, and I met Halsey Stevens and a whole bunch of other people, and, and it was very, very cool. And, and Dr. Lynn said, oh, Marty, you'd probably like to see what my son's doing. He has a little studio in his garage. And so I went out to meet his son, and it's Roger Lynn. Roger Lynn invented the Lynn drum, and I was there. I played that Lynn drum. I was a master's student. I had absolutely no money, and he was selling this for like, I don't know, $6,000 or something. But I played that thing, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. Now, let me back up for one second. You guys are probably starting to think that I'm some sort of Forrest Gump person. I mean, <laughs> really? Paul McCartney, Roger Lynn, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. Yes, it all happened. It's just if you're old enough, you, this might happen. So anyway, moved back to Chicago, like I said, started working with Mike in the studio. Oh, that's me. Um, and we didn't have enough money to buy a Lindrum, which was spectacularly cool. We, didn't have, we finally got enough money to buy this Prophet 5. The first little thing you heard me play, that was done on a TR-808, which I still have. Anybody know what that is? It's a little rolling drum machine. It's great. It's just amazing. And uh, Prophet Pro 1, the single synthesizer, uh, single oscillator synthesizer. But we got the Prophet 5. The other thing we bought then, as soon as we could, was this thing, the Drumulator. I love this ad. <laughs> this is the last drum machine we would ever need. It's like, there it is. It's the one thing it won't do. It's become obsolete. So here we are. This is to put it in context. In the back of my keyboard magazine, which I would get, and I had my Drumulator, I saw another ad that said, here you go. Great sounds, Digidrums digital sound chips for the Drumulator. It was like, okay, this is all we'll ever need because now the technology is to the place where we can make our own sounds and, and dump them into the Drumulator or the SP12 or if we finally got an emulator. What's funny about this is that these guys, the Digidrum guys, two guys from Berkeley who were, they were trying to figure out a way to support the band they were in, and so they started Digidrums, which of course turned into Digidesign. And then, once again, Forrest Gump, I met these guys when they were doing Digidrums, because I would call them up and they would send me stuff. Uh, Digidesign, which of course now is a division of Avid, and uh, they invented Pro Tools, and okay, this is all you'll ever need to do everything. Uh, so my point with this is, this will never stop. The technology, the advancing in technology, the advancement of tools that you can work with, the, the amount of programs. Oh, do you have the latest program? What, what? Pressure, pressure. Of course you don't have the latest program. So what? Okay, I mean, how do you create? Don't, don't start going down the road that I went down and I'm still on, which is this treadmill of trying to always have the latest, greatest, cutting edge stuff, because it's, it's just insane. Moore's Law, look it up. Uh, so here's, what, here's the point. Yes, technology is a wonderful thing. It is chocolate and peanut butter when it comes to creativity. You want the advancing technology because you do amazing things. But with every advance I have come to realize in my old age, with every advance, there's probably something you left behind. There's something you used to do you no longer do. There's some sort of loss. And you know, one of the losses that I had was for the longest time, I stopped working with drummers. You saw that whole period of time, drummers. It's like, why would I ever need a drummer again? And think about it. Think of the tragedy of this. 
the guy who told me I should be a composer was the drummer in my band. And boom, for like 25, 30 years, I just almost never worked with real drummers because we had this technology. Now, that doesn't mean that some of the stuff you can do isn't cool or good, but there's something about live musicians, live drummers, interacting with real people that's so much better than samplers and the technology. And what I would say is, when you have these tools, they can certainly change what you do. They can also change how you do it. And they can change how you're being creative. But the problem is when they start to change how you think. And I think it sneaks up on you. I think you don't realize when this is happening. And I'm going to talk about technology that isn't necessarily from an engineer. Here's the technology advance that happened. We even touched on it today a few times. You go from non-notated Gregorian chant and all the other music that was happening around the time. We all know about Gregorian chant because that's what the history books tell us about. We didn't have any notated uh, um, bards and troubadours and trouvères and all the rest of it. We didn't, we didn't know what everybody was doing, but I guarantee you they were having fun. There were dances, there were bands of string instruments, they were doing crazy fun things. There were recorders, there were lutes, there were things, they were playing music. Well, somebody figured out how to do this new technology, which is notation. And you put stuff on a grid, you can show it to other people, and if they learn how to read this thing, they can get lined up and they can all get together and you can start reading music. And what does reading music get us to? It gets us incredible understanding of theory. We can talk about theory. We can start to have a common language about music theory. We can talk, we, I guarantee you, counterpoint became a real thing for composers because of notation. I think it's harder to do counterpoint if you don't have a way of notating. Um, harmony became a thing. You have this now nice vertical grid and you can start understanding what's going on with harmony. So it's great. Nothing wrong with this technology. What did we walk away from? Anybody? What do you think we lost? Yes! Okay, you both are right. I could see that you knew that was what I was going to say. Now, we didn't lose improvisation totally. It was a common practice. People still improvise. We all probably can improvise to an extent. But I can guarantee you, and I know this in my own life, especially being someone who's taught formally and reads music and, and the whole thing, that it's much harder to improvise when you're staring at notes on a page. It just is. It doesn't mean it's impossible. And it doesn't mean, oh, we should get rid of uh, printed music or, or that this was a mistake. But just remember that. There used to be a time where this is how music was made. Music was made because people got together, and who knows how they actually did it, but there was just a lot of improvisation going on. So um, let me just say one other thing, too. Uh, just one other thing. That, that, that was a laugh line. <laughs> uh, people, there are people out there, like my friend Sir Paul McCartney, who revel in the fact that they don't read music. And do you think I'm going to tell Paul you should be reading music? That would be really dumb. Now, do I think he, he might be a better composer if he actually figured out how to read music? Maybe. But there's something that's going on with him that he's afraid of formalizing that thing that could make his gut response to songwriting and composition go away. So he's proud of the fact that he doesn't read music. I wouldn't recommend not learning how to read music, but I have seen tons of students over the years who go down the reading music path, they go down a music theory path, they get very blocked into a lot of things, and something about their freedom to improvise or freedom to create starts to just get impinged upon, infringed, whatever. So here's another thing. Back in the day, this is a piano piece I wrote. As a matter of fact, you can hear this very piece on my new album, Echoes of the First Dreamer, which I'm not pushing. <laughs> it is available now, okay. <laughs> But I actually wrote this piano piece years ago, and then I also orchestrated it just recently for the album. Uh, 
But this is me, this is my uh, calligraphy. So this is me with vellum paper and learning about nibs and ink and thinking about how to write down my music calligraphically. Uh, that's the last time I did that. Because, I mean, now I, uh, right? Why, why should I bother with pen and ink? And I wouldn't necessarily want to go back to that. I mean, copying parts is like a total pain in the ass. Uh, doing that is just so time consuming. But the thing I still think about, I wonder every once in a while, um, because I have Sibelius or Finale or whatever tool I happen to be using, um, has the way that I actually think about composing or the way I approach composing changed in some way? I, I honestly don't know. I really don't know. But I know that every once in a while when I sit down with pencil and paper, something different happens. And when I walk away from the sequencer and the keyboard and I do a different approach, something else happens. So just keep that in mind. Whatever is your preferred method, remember that there's, you're using a tool, maybe you're comfortable with it, but break out of that every once in a while because it could actually change the way you think about stuff. So, all right, palette change. Not really a palette change, but this is just something you can look at while I blather on here. Um, I want you to think about how you use your sequencer. What is the thing that the sequencer just automatically, every sequencer in the world wants you to start with, if, it, if at all possible? There you go. Default. 44120. Tempo, click. You have to physically change something, or you have to turn that all off and just try to just play, whatever it is. But capturing a Roboto performance and then getting other people to play with something that's Roboto, and by the way, Roboto, that's not something strange. That's the history of music. Like everything was Roboto, just about. Everything that's performed with Roboto until you get to like dance music. And so the fact that like we are stuck in this, we're letting the guys who write the tools, like sequencer tools, dictate to us that we should have a click. Roboto is hard to work with, makes you go, oh, okay. I'll, I'll go the easy way for a while. Same with samplers. Listen to the string patch. Oh my gosh, the string patch is beautiful. Try to do something that real strings do? Ugh, it doesn't sound very good. So what do you do? Ah, I'm just gonna do the thing that sounds good. You, your music has now been limited by your tools. And you start thinking that this is what strings do. And this is what's good about quantizing. Um, I'm also friends with Niall Rogers, who's a music producer. He was in a band called Chic, um, which was a dance band in the disco age. One time we were talking and he said, he goes, Marty, you know, me and Bernard, the bass player, we used to work for hours to get a groove that sounded absolutely tight. That's my Niall Rogers impression. Okay, <laughs> probably shouldn't do that, but he's, he is the key. He is the mayor of Cool Town. He is so cool. But he, we talk about how, he says, and that was all in the 70s, before sequences, before MIDI. We didn't quantize anything. We sounded like we were quantized before there was quantized. And, and <laughs> I was just thinking, yeah, like, we don't even have to bother working with other people to sound tight. We could just say, yeah, yeah, that close enough, and hit the button, lock it all in. Um, and I, I don't know what that means other than I think we've lost something. All right, so what is this conference about again? It's music for games? Okay. Um, okay, so what about games? Well, that's another thing. Moore's Law again, look it up. Games have advanced so ridiculously in my lifetime. I was thinking about showing you like the commercial for the Odyssey and you know, showing you the first page of the text adventure dungeon that I played in 1977. You're standing in front of a White House, there's a mailbox there. You all know that text adventure. I mean, think about that. That was the height of computer games. One pixel white thing, another white thing, Pong. Uh, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm controlling my own TV. So pretty amazing. So that's, I was already in college when these things came out. And 
there was no music, there was barely any sound. So think of how far we've advanced. So I love the fact that technology has advanced. I love the fact that I had in my studio tape and editing blocks and tape that stuck things together and razor blades and a little grease pencil that you would mark where you were gonna edit. That's what we used to do back in my day. I mean, it, took, it was a big deal to make an edit on your tape. You wouldn't have video games. I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't have had a career in video games if we didn't have digital audio, because now I have hundreds of thousands of edits probably in any, maybe even, well, I don't, I'm not even gonna count, but it's a lot. It's Moore's Law, lots. Uh, the, the number of edits you do to sound files, the, the, the number of edits you do, the, the, the kind of work you do in multiple tracks that are just endless. There's no limit to what you do with this technology. You couldn't do any of these video games if we were still working with grease pencils. True story, we had just, we were in that, that studio that burned down, so this is how recent this is. It was in the 90s, and we were still working on music, and Mike needed to make some sort of an edit, and he goes, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know where the grease pencil is, like the grease pencil. And I'm like, that's it. We're going to buy a box of grease pencils and a box of razor blades, and we're going to make sure we never run out of that stuff. <laughs> like the next day, Pro Tools and sound, it was the sound designer too we had in the, and it was like, that was it. I don't think we made, made another edit ever. Do you know how long it takes to go through one grease pencil going like this, one mark? I don't know either, but it's a lot. <laughs> but anyway, I don't know where that box is. It probably got burned, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> so my, the thing I'd like to leave you with here in this part of this talk, um, let's be aware of how fast we're advancing. And we're advancing faster than human beings are comfortable with. There's just no doubt about that. Um, but let's not forget that, that, let's not advance so fast that, that we forget what we might be leaving behind. Like every once in a while, just take a second and think about, wait, what, what am I leaving behind? What, what's, lo what's the loss here? So don't let the current tools, whatever they are, uh, control what you create. Use the tools to create what you control, which is your imagination. Thank you very much. Wait, actually, that's not true. <laughs> you could have clapped, but you didn't, so that's all right. <laughs> your penalty is I still have one more thing. Uh, so I lied about not pushing product. So, <laughs> my new company, Highwire Games, which is, uh, uh, started a couple years ago by me and a f designer friend, Jamie Griesmer, who was one of the lead designers on Halo and he Destiny. Uh, he actually left Bungie before I did. Okay, that's good. <laughs> and when he found out that I was leaving Bungie, he, uh, he called me and said, let's get together Let's, let's do something. Forget about a AAA company that's got 700 people in it. Let's, let's you and I, and, and we found a technical uh, a guy to join us, and we started a small company called Highwire Games. And it's an indie company, and we got a deal with PlayStation Virtual Reality, PSVR, and this game is coming in March. So here's a little hint of what this game looks like.
There you go. Thank you. And the soundtrack, <laughs> the prequel to Golem, the musical prequel to Golem is available now. It's called Echoes of the First Dreamer. You can buy it today. <coughs> or you, maybe you should buy it today. It's a thought. <laughs> and it includes vinyl. Think about that. I actually, I'm like, yeah, you know what? Vinyl's making a comeback. The thing we lost when CDs came out, that was the end of vinyl. Except it's not. It's so wonderful to see vinyl making a comeback. Real quick, I got this one extra thing. The piano came in, destroyed the harpsichord. Everybody liked the, the soft, right? The soft loud. <laughs> the uh, Paris Conservatory of Music started burning harpsichords for firewood. <laughs> I kid you not. I saw it in a TED talk, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now comes the exciting part where we get to ask some questions, and I'm going to ask the first one because sure. I get to. <laughs> um, <laughs> And if you want to ask a question, we have this thing we have to pass around so it can be heard on the live stream, okay? So I know this could be a whole essay, but just shortly so other people get to ask things. I was wondering how you're working all this virtual reality stuff now. What is the difference between working with, I hate to say this, but traditional game audio and virtual reality game audio? Uh, it is amazingly painful. Uh, talk about what I've left behind. It is so hard to even experience what you've put in and implemented. You have to put this stupid thing on your head and headphones and it's HRTF, so like it's, uh, it's real 3D audio or, you know, it's, it's, believe me, it's real 3D audio, sure. It's HRTF, which is almost there. Someday it's gonna be really amazing. Um, VR is not the matrix. Just, if anybody's seen VR, it's not, we're not there. Don't take the red pill yet, it's not. <laughs> Uh, but it is extremely cool, it's amazing technology, and it does make you think differently about how you create. But even just to mix something once you get that on. Basically, I have my, my intern buddy sit next to me, and I've got this on, and I'm just telling him, yeah, th 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 it's too loud, the thing is over here, it's gotta do this, and he's taking, furiously taking notes, because you're stuck. I can't write something down when I'm inside this w virtual world. So um, even, even that is hard. And the other part that's hard is you're working with tools that uh, create, let you create audio and music and experiences, but then to get the whole thing to work, you're working through, let's say, you know, you have Pro Tools, then you have sound, uh, sound uh, effects stuff that you're working with, and then you have recordings you've made and music files that you put into WISE, and then WISE has to be implemented through uh, Unreal 4, and Unreal 4 has to communicate with the PlayStation VR stuff. There's so many circular finger-pointing blame things that can happen in that chain of events. So it's like, I'm not hearing something. Oh, that's because of Sony. Oh, no, that's because of Wise. Oh, that's because of this, that's because of that. And it's, it, the technology's gotten um, very complex. But I wouldn't trade it for anything because it's the next new cool thing, and it's going to be a blast. So there you go. Oh, okay. um, so I don't know how many other like performers we have in the room, but that's what I do, and I teach um, you know kids how to play music and stuff, and they're all super interested in this stuff, and I am too, and that's why I'm here. Um, but so, what advice would you give to like young students who are like, man, I really would love to play movie music or video game music or whatever when I grow up? How do you break into that world? Um. So I told you my story, and like I said, don't follow in the footsteps of the master. I'm not saying I'm a master, but don't follow in my footsteps. Everybody's gonna have their own path. One thing that's common, I think, though, is that you, you know somebody. <laughs> so your friends, your colleagues, your classmates, super important. Because somebody's gonna be doing something that's kinda interesting, and they're an artist, they're a programmer, they're, they're trying to design a game, 
and they need help. And if you are their friend, you should give them help. So if you, know, if you want to play music, play music. Don't worry about playing movie music or game music. Just be good at playing music, because that's what's valuable, right? So be good at music, uh, be friendly with your friends, and be very available. And once you're available, you're going to find, suddenly you're going to have a little portfolio of cool stuff that you did, and that's going to make you valuable to somebody like me, or somebody like Blizzard, or 150,000 different independent game developers that are out there that are looking for somebody that knows what they're doing and has done something. Hello. What's the chord progression you find yourself using the most oh. in video game music? <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting question. Uh, I, I, wanna, I don't think I want to think about it. <laughs> what about that? Da, 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 da. The one that played in the... No, well, that's in that one. That's the only time I've ever used that. <laughs> uh, no, I tend, to, I tend to like, you know, for thematic things, I, I believe that tonality and some sort of pitch center is really important. Uh, the other thing that's available online right now is this thing that I did for Destiny. It was also a musical prequel. It's called Music of the Spheres. You can download it for free right now. You can download it for free. You should all go download it for free. And then when you feel guilty, you can also buy... <laughs> uh, but a lot of times what I'll do is, uh, if I'm thinking about just a general mood setting thing, like for Halo, uh, I knew I wanted to do a monk. I, Dorian is the best monk key. I wanted it to be Dorian, so I did Dorian. Monk key, hmm, okay. Uh, I think for Reach, and then with uh, ODST, it, was, it had more jazz I wants to it, to it, so I did some, some jazz stuff. And then um, uh, for Reach, I think I wanted that to have a more ethnic feel, so I did a Phrygian thing. I like the modes because they're not just straight major minor. Um, so modes can just make you think a little bit differently. For Destiny and Ma Music of the Spheres, I, I worked with the... Yeah, there's a technical term for it. It's basically a scale that I like, which is Lydian with a flat five. Uh, there's like five different kinds of ways of naming that scale. But it's just an interesting... Uh, and of course, it's not the only thing I work in. It's just like I like to have certain themes that say, hey, this sounds like destiny. You know, this sounds like a certain thing. And you'll hear it crop up in different places. For this, I'm, I'm definitely Lydian, uh, major sevenths. Um, so... Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, okay. What were your main inspirations for the flood sections in the Halo series? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I, if you're talking musically, of course, it was it's like monsters, and I did a lot of atonal and disturbing and pulsing and and sound designy stuff. Uh, but the, the the actual sounds the flood made, I made. So. <laughs> now, do you know what the secret is there? What did I just do? Inhaled. Inhaled. Yeah. As soon as you inhale, you're, you sound like a monster. So I, everybody does that, and it works. It's a trope. No. It's a... <laughs> I'm going to learn these things, I promise. And I'm looking at you. You're going to help me. <laughs> so you mentioned the... Uh downfall of the harpsichord, and I think it's actually interesting to note that not everybody abandoned it. Actually, Bach had access to a forte piano, and he hated it. Um, oh, but see, I didn't know that. I always, well, of course, those early forte pianos, if, if he had access to one, it probably sounded pretty horrible. I know he had the clavier, yeah. which was just soft, soft. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, I, I, can't, I can't believe, like, if Bach was playing a nine-foot concert Steinway he, Grand. He's he pretty he crotchety it. about it. Well, he's so. old. I'm, I know what it is to be crotchety. <laughs> well, well spe speaking of, you know, limitations of technology, you know, obviously the harpsichord was limited um, as it could only really play soft. Um, and so or different loud. composers um, would ornament their music to make it interesting. They would use your rubato. rubato. Um, so I guess my question for you is, even though we lose something through technology, doesn't that loss or limitation 
help to expand upon, upon creativity uh, by forcing us to problem solve in different ways? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. That's why my answer to the question is yes. Like, it's both, right? So, uh, but I think we can get trapped into doing something like the Paris Conservatory did. It was like, well, that's it. We found our thing. Piano it is, harpsichords, firewood. Uh, that's, that's the wrong approach. I mean, um, I mean, and I still marvel. I, I personally, I'm not a huge fan of pipe organ, but when I've seen, you know, really good players, uh, play pipe organ and they can do all this stuff with their feet at the same time, I'm just, I'm totally blown away. But that isn't, you know, I, those, that, the, I bet you the brain, the neural pathways of organists are just amazing. I just got to believe it is. So I think you're right in terms of problem solving. It, you know, you, you walk away from something. The very first organ, by the way, I looked this up, it was going to be part of my talk, but instead it's here was invented by a Greek engineer because he, he needed to solve the problem, how do I get a single musician to play multiple wind instruments? So he had multiple pipes, he had water pressure on a thing, and the keys, you played with your fist. Now we don't do that anymore. Did we really lose something by not having a keyboard that you can only play with your fist? <laughs> Probably not, but it'd be kind of cool to see. I mean, was like, who knows what that is? But uh, you know, the history of keyboards uh, and all musical instruments, it's, it's just this constant technological advance. Recording, we didn't even talk about recording. Oh my gosh, that's it's a 20th century invention and it's changed everything. I mean, composers used to have it made because there was no recording. Like, oh, the maestro's new thing is gonna be premiered tonight and unless we're there, we'll never hear it. It has to be performed. Now they don't, we don't, no one calls me a maestro anymore. <laughs> All right, one final question. <laughs> Hello? Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, speaking of technology and, and all that jazz, uh, <laughs> I was curious, like, when you first start composing a song or anything, uh, do you find yourself jumping into, you know, opening up your computer and popping on some VST right away, or do you find yourself at a piano, or I'm just curious what your the um, inklings are for you. So depending on where the technology was, back in the day when I was writing for my band, when I was in college, I had a little cassette recorder next to me, and I'd sit at the piano, and I would figure out something cool and record that part, and then I would play it back and play something over it. So that I, I thought was very cool. So that's what Pro Tools or Sequence or you know, any, any sort of sequencer gives you that ability to immediately start thinking that way. Um, a lot of times I'll get stuck in that rut, and I'll immediately turn the computer on, I'll immediately put my hands on the keyboard, and you know, maybe I'll bring up contact and a bunch of really cool instruments I haven't listened to yet, and I'll get lost in some deep, ridiculous menu of things. Don't you hate it when you, like, you see something and it's like, oh, look at these instruments that are there, that's great. I can handle that. And then you see some little button, some menu button, and you click on it, and then <laughs> And you're like, oh man, and there's another button. <laughs> so. Uh, you can get completely lost in that stuff. So every once in a while, I'll just go up out of my studio and go to a, you know, a real piano, this grand piano, and play at that for a while. And then, of course, the old, I was driving in my car, and I knew I had to do some ancient-sounding monk thing, and I was in the car, and that's where I wrote, I made the decision, uh, there's going to be Dorian, and I was like, okay, da 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 Okay, good, good, good. Uh, I'm not, I can't steal any monk chants because I don't have any memorized, so I'm just going to write one. <laughs> but, let's see, uh, maybe four phrases, you know, oh yeah, yes, yesterday is a great melody. Yesterday, da 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 Oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> and no one can tell that that's... <laughs> So that's, I, I was away from a keyboard, and I actually think I, it, Flintstones Vitamins was another one I did in the car. Go Cubs, go. Go Cubs, go. We are Flintstones kids. 10 million strong and going. Okay, and that's how fast it, that's how quickly I did it. 
right, what I just did. Okay. Okay, before we give the most thunderous applause I hope you ever hear, <laughs> although you just did a video games live concert, probably won't compare, but anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, I want to remind people, the conference center, we can continue this conversation. Gaming session, I'll see some of you tonight, and we restart at 9 a.m. tomorrow with my talk. I'm so early, but I'm going to be interesting. I promise I'll wake you up. Yes. Thank you so much, Marty O'Donnell. Thank you.